Greg Meskel here with you. Thanks so much for joining us on a Thursday, more of our Why We Play series. We're joined now by four-time Olympian, 08 silver medalist, Ryan Bailey. Ryan, thanks for joining us. Thanks, Greg. So the topic of this conversation, and for those that watched during At Home, we had a talk with Ryan and a few of his 2008 teammates, and it was all about uh, getting, getting to the podium in 2008 and what a journey that was. But Ryan hit on some really interesting stuff about overcoming adversity uh, he, had, he had been on the 2004 Olympic teams, and those didn't result in podium trips. And then, you know, kind of, kind of going off what we talked about, we thought this would be a great larger conversation. So, you know, I think we were talking before we started here, but you touched on a bit. Um, what was that process like for you? Maybe it goes back to your high school or college days, but when did you start getting familiar with kind of disappointment or, or loss and then figuring out how do I – get over it? How do I get my teammates to get over it? Yeah, so Greg, you know, I'm, I'm a rare exception. I, I went to a high school program that was not great at water polo. We finished third place in our league every year, and we got beaten up on nonstop. Um, so it was tough, and you got to get used to playing against better teams and playing against better players and try and improve yourself every day. Um, what it did for me, because I was a good player and I was the focus of our offense is it taught me how to play against multiple defenders which later in my career would help because you know you learn to be the the man I guess and I, you know, I kind of carried on and I learned how to uh, deal with a lot of people at the same time and then going um, from that high school to college right I mean you you were also in a college program that when you were there it didn't win an NCAA championship right nope. but you're but you're going up against the very best teams yeah, I went to UC Irvine, and at that time, uh, Ted Newland was there. And, you know, we were in the top four teams every year, but we never got over the hump and won. And actually, on those teams, I played with four or five other Olympians. So we were a talented group, a hardworking group, and that's kind of what we were known for. But, you know, we'd always lose to, you know, at that time it was UCLA or, you know, Cal or Stanford. and. Um, we lost the important games and, you know, our coach was, you know, kind of famous for being a, a tough guy. And what I, what I took from those losses where we would, you know, lose these really emotional games and they were tough and we would always have morning practice the day after the game that we lost. So I'm sure it's an NC2A violation, <laughs> but we would, we would have morning workout the day after. And that was just kind of the teaching method to where, Hey, you know, you lost this one, but you got to stay in the fight and keep fighting. And that's what, what he, he built his life about. And just, you know, you're, you, you might be the underdog, but you got to keep fighting. And eventually you'll catch up to these guys and pass them. And I'm sure a lot of athletes go through this where if you're on a team, high school, college, whatever it is, where you're not winning the things that you want to win, but you're working really hard. How do you know that what you're doing is the right thing if you're not getting the results you want to get? No, that's, that's an interesting question. And I think it's just, you got to believe and you got to love it. Um, I mean, for me, it wasn't necessarily about the results all the time. It couldn't be because I didn't have any results for, for a long time. Um, it was just about, I loved water polo. I would always try and find uh, places to get in the water and go do more. And just the belief that, you know, if I work harder than the person who's maybe more talented or better than me, if I work harder than them, I'm catching up to them every single day. And so little by little, you keep working hard, you keep staying after, you keep doing the things that you're supposed to be doing. Little by little, you can end up passing people who maybe are more talented than you. Um, and so new one kind of drilled that into us. And I mean, all of my teammates found that to be the case. Um, we were never afraid to work hard. You know working out the day after a big loss and lifting weights all summer long. And so we got trained to work hard and just keep, keep grinding. And, uh, Hey, being a grinder, it beats talent every time. You mentioned all the UCI guys that would go on to become Olympians. And if you look at the rosters through the, through the, through the two thousands, especially there's always three, four, five guys from UCI Irvine. It feels like, and I, and I know a lot of that, culture that program as you kind of talked about there was a little bit of that underdog mentality of going up against the big four or, or uh -huh. however you want to view those other programs was was that a useful tool to feel like you were you were going after something that people didn't think you should have 
Oh, the, the us against them mentality is a great motivator. And uh, no one was the best at it. Um, you know, I used to, I don't think I've shared this ever, but we used to, I used to have dreams where he and I were in back to back and fighting everyone, you know, and fighting big groups of people. And he's uh, he was a great, great uh, water polo coach, great guy to be around. And he always preached hard work is the only thing that matters. And uh, and, and when, once you get to the national team level, um, why I think the UCI guys had so much success. And I think from 84, between 84 and 2008, there was more UCI Olympians than any other college, any other big four school. Um, and the reason why is because we weren't afraid to work. We could fit into a team because, you know, none of us felt like we were the superstar. We could play a role. Uh, we, we, we would show up to practice and not complain, and we would just do what we were supposed to do. And, hey, you find on the national team, that some people just aren't willing to, to, to do what's necessary to get it done. And you want people who are willing to work hard and put in the time. And, and uh, that's what UCI was known for. And uh, that's what we did. I love the story. I have to explore the visual further of you and Newland. I'm picturing like yeah. an action movie where like you're in an alleyway and you're back to back and maybe you're down to your last, you know, baton or knife or whatever. And the gang is closing in and you guys have to fight them off. Absolutely. It's, you know, come on, Bales, let's get them. And we're back to back going at it. I mean, <laughs> college dreams, right? These are, these are a long time ago, but that was my mentality when I was in school. So uh, as you're working your way up, you make that 2000 Olympic team. And that was a team, you know, to give reference, and we touched on this a bit during the 2008 talk, people often just measure the team by the Olympic results, right? So they just look back and say, well, no medal for 20 years between 88 and 2008. But that 2000 team, that was a team that won the World Cup, which was the most important event of the year in 97. It, yep. it was a very good team moving forward. Tell us a little bit more about that 2000 experience. And I know it didn't, it didn't go the right way, but it's one of those times that you had to work past the adversity of the result. Uh, you know, the 2000 team was very talented. Chris Humbert's a super talented center, great player. Uh, Chris Oding was the team captain, great player, won four titles at Cal, lost three games in his entire college career. Uh, Wolf Ligo, Brad Schumacher, just a great group, really good players. Um, in the quarterfinal game, um, we played against the Russians. We, we did fine in our group, and we were crossing over against the Russians. I think we were third in the group, and they were second. Um, and final minute of the game, or actually at halftime, they scored a full court shot to score a goal. Then there was another half court shot that also went in. And then, you know, Tony Azevedo had a breakaway with 10 seconds to go to tie the game. They catch, they catch him from behind, pull him underwater, no call from the ref. Huh. Um, and so, you know, that quarterfinal game is really all that matters between playing for five through eight and playing – for a medal and so you know this happens and it's of course disappointing I mean Dan Hackett was a great goalie these types of things didn't happen to him they did this game um, Tony's going to score that counterattack eight out of ten times and the referee's going to call a penalty shot didn't happen that day so you, you just kind of come to the realization that you know like we were talking about earlier Greg is that you can train for four years you can put all this time in, and sometimes these things come down to a small play that you can't control. Sometimes these comes down to a bounce of a ball, a no call by a referee, a missed shot, a rebound. And, you know, as being part of an Olympic team, and I went to a few, you have to learn to accept that as part of the game. And to, like I said, 2000 was a super gifted team physically, and – you know, we, we just had bad luck that day, I feel like. Um, and it was, it was close, but we just couldn't get it done. It's, it's one of those things, and it's probably comparable to the March Madness basketball tournament or I guess maybe the NFL playoffs where it's just that one-and-done environment where you, you, you don't get to collectively show, even think about, say, the World Series or the NBA Finals where odds are the better team wins because they can prove it, you know, best out of yeah, they get five seven instead of seven. Yeah. Um, no, it's, I mean, water polo can really come down to the fourth quarter, one small mistake or one bad bounce. And, you know, if you, if you think about it, you have to train four years to get to the Olympics. 
And so four years of your life can come down to one small moment. And uh, it's, it's different to think about it that way, but that's the reality. Now, you were, you were one of the younger members of that team. It was your first Olympics. What, what was it like? And, and maybe you knew it right away going in, or maybe it was, it was after. And I know your dad was heavily involved in the programs. So maybe he talked to you about the weight of this. But after you get back from Sydney, what's, what's the process like understanding the weight of those games in comparison to every other game you'd play and how people were kind of measuring you in the group by those results? Uh, you know, you know, it's it's um, it's a strange thing coming back from Olympics. And I know there's an HBO documentary about uh, you know Olympians and the weight of winning a medal. I don't necessarily believe in all that, but you know that was my lifelong goal is to make an Olympic team, and to accomplish your lifelong goal when you're 23 years old is strange. And so it, it takes a little bit of time after the Olympics to you know refocus, set new goals figure out what the next thing is and start moving forward. And, you know, there's definitely a, a weird thing for a week or two after the Olympics, just because, you know, you've also been hanging out with these guys every day for the last six months. And so once the Olympics are over, everybody goes their own direction and does their own thing. And then you're like, well, wait, you're not going to tell me when I have to, where I have to be, when I have to do this. You're not going to feed me and bring me lunch. You're not going to tell me what practice or what my swim set is. You're just kind of on your own. And so, it takes a, a, a bit of an adjustment and you just have to figure out what the next thing is. I mean, uh, it, it's, it's definitely tough. Uh, following that Olympics, I coached, uh, I, I did a little coaching in high school and then uh, just got right back into it, you know, at first of the year. Just right back to the grind. And then that would lead yep. you up to the 2004 games. And as we touched a bit, uh, you know, during, during the 2008 talk, 2004 games and that lead up still have this legendary lore for the, for the training, you know, and yeah. maybe this was something you didn't even know you were built for your whole life, right? To go oh. through a training like that. You talked about it a little bit, but uh, I don't, I personally never tire of these stories. What, you know, if, if you think back on that training, how was it unlike anything you ever experienced before or after? You know, uh, with the previous team, the furthest you would swim was, you know, 3,000 meters, which is, you know, you, 45 minutes, you get in, you throw the ball, you swim a little bit, you throw the ball around. And, and uh, I, I still remember the, the, the first year, Ratko was suspended. He got suspended at the 2000 games for, you know, throwing a cone at a referee when the Italians lost and uh, or it was something like that. And so he was suspended year one. And so we kind of eased into it. I mean, we started swimming 20 times 200. That was his favorite set. And that was, that's four grand right there. And so we were swimming a lot, we felt like. And there was no way we could ever swim more than this. I mean, it was crazy. And then I'll never forget, we, we were down in the Dominican Republic. And my dad was the, the athletic trainer on the team. And he comes in and goes, hey, I think you guys better get ready to do some serious swimming. I just heard, you know, that this, this isn't going to, they're going to swim like eight to 10 grand every, every day. I'm like, that'll never happen. There's no way I've never experienced this. And what, there's no reason to swim that long. And uh, sure enough, he built us up to it. And, you know, we, we would be, you know, around this time they started playing every other day um, in world championships. And so Previously, it would be, you know, you take a day off, you relax, you jump in the water and float around, maybe do a little shooting. With Ratko, it was, okay, you have a day off, we're going to swim. And we would swim six to eight grand, excuse me, we would swim six to eight grand on our off days. Wow. And then we would also do water polo. So it was just a different level of training and there was no days off and you know, one thing he brought to us, which was, which I think really ended up helping us over time is, you know, when we would go to Europe before, it was kind of, we would, you know, do what we're supposed to be doing, but, you know, there was also time to have fun and go sightseeing and, and see other things. And Ratko, it was, hey, we're wearing the same thing every day. We're wearing the same thing wherever we go. Um, we're not here to see sights. We're here to train and rest. And that's all. And if, you know, you could walk down the street to grab a quick coffee, but other than that, you were in the hotel and expected to be resting. And we had zero downtime. Trips took a whole different, um, 
whole different light. You know, they used to be, it used to be great to go to Europe and just have, we could go get ice cream and go have a beer if we wanted. And with Radco, it was a different thing. And uh, it took a while to adjust, but we did. And it brought us close, it brought us closer as a team and showed us what you need to do if you want to be good, what you need to do, how hard you need to work, what things you have to be willing to give up if you want to be successful. And uh, it was a great learning lesson for all of the American guys. And if you look at the players who are on that team, um, a lot of them have gone on to be really successful coaches. I mean, Segesman, uh, you know, won six titles in a row. Adams won most, multiple national titles. Fred Ormsby is a great coach in uh, South County and San Diego or in Orange County. And, you know, they're taking some, and Dan, Dan Layson, uh, UC Davis, they've grown a ton in the last few years. Um, but they are taking these lessons from Ratco where, hey, we're a team. This is a team sport. We're going to work out hard together and we're going to be together all the time. And, uh, I, you know, Ratco gets a lot of heat because of how hard we work. But at the same time, he taught us what it means to be on a team and to be a championship level team. Even though we did win, it was that. You had talked about this kind of being the second time, if you think about Newland, where you were put in this like situation where it was going to be max effort. And it was interesting because I think it's the, probably the second time where you, you uh, came into a situation with a coach that his resume preceded him, right? So when you come to UC Irvine, Newland's won multiple titles. When you start sure. playing for Racco, he's already considered this, this great coach. Does that help the process to buy into what you would otherwise think is kind of crazy? I mean, at the time, and I've, my views have changed on Racco a ton because at the time I hated him. Like, it was so hard because, you know, hey, why are we working this hard? I don't understand. And he, he's not going to sit down and explain it to you. He's, not, he's just going to tell you, what you what, what's expected of you, and you have to do it. If you don't do it, get out of here. I mean, I, I still remember the first couple of years, he would literally, um, he would find players that he didn't, get along with and he'd cut them and they'd be like come on man you can't cut me and he'd be like hey I've cut the best players in the world I don't care about cutting you I'm not gonna miss you if this is your attitude we'll see you later and so Ratko um I mean he was straight up with guys he's like hey if you don't want to be a part of this if you don't want to follow the program and do what we're doing hey I understand go have a great summer you can play water polo on your own but you're not playing for me and uh, so at the time it was rough. Um, now, as I've gotten older, I respect a lot more how much time and work he put into it. Um, Cause we weren't the only ones working our, our, working our butts off. Ratko was too. And uh, he came over here, not really speaking great English. He figured out the American system and the American player in the first three months he was here. He's really a smart man. And uh, he got us everything moving all of U.S. water polo moving in the right direction in a short period of time. It was really impressive what he did. Now, even, even though you're doing these, these intense workouts, and at the time you're like, I, I, you know, this is terrible and I'm not liking it, is there a moment, maybe it's 03 or 04, I don't know where, where it would have been, where you kind of said to yourself, like, this is miserable, but wow, I am in some amazing shape right now. No, great. I'm having – tears in my goggles <laughs> every day when you're calling out the swim sets i mean it is so bad and you're so beaten down i mean we would take afternoons off and he'd call it a, a day off and we're like but wait we haven't had a day off in two weeks it's like oh, you had wednesday afternoon off and you're just like oh okay we would work out for two weeks straight and have one half day off and then we would do it all over again and we would play games on our off days and uh, there was, there was not a time during the 2004 era where I felt great. I felt great at the Olympics, and I felt great two months after the Olympics because I was still in shape. Um, and it was, it's, a, it's a different feeling when you can play a whole game and not get tired, and that's kind of where we all were. So you had, you had kind of taken us through the 2000 tournament, the 2004 tournament. Again, guys that are in peak, peak condition, right, have worked really hard but it again comes down to, like you talked about, just a moment that doesn't, that doesn't go the team's way. Yeah, uh, you know, it was, again, it was the Russians again. Um, the, it, it was the best. It was Serbia and Montenegro combined. 
great team. It was the Hungarians' best team. They, they won three gold medals. It was their best team. They were all, you know, 28 years old in their prime. Uh, the Hungarians, it was, hung, it was uh, Serbia and Montenegro combined. That was their best team. Um, we beat a great Croatia team in the group. And uh, we lost to the Russians, who was, it's the best, you know, Russian team since 1980. Um, so, hey, those are the three games we lost. We lost to Serbia, Hungary, and Russia. And we were fourth in our group. And then we never lost another game. I mean, in my mind, uh, the Greeks ended up fourth in that tournament. Um, we had beaten Greece five out of five times in Greece two weeks, two weeks before the Olympics. So in my mind, I know it'll never show and people don't necessarily appreciate it, but we were the fourth best team there. And I don't take consolation from that. Um, there were better teams than us, but we were closer than a lot of people give us credit for. We're talking to Ryan Bailey here, four-time Olympian for Team USA, kind of on, on overcoming adversity throughout, throughout a long career. And, um, you know, not to kind of hit on, right, some of your most painful moments, but I think it's valuable for the audience to understand, you know, someone as accomplished as you still had to work through these challenges. And so you come off 2004, you can't work any harder. You can't put any more work in, and the result is not a medal. How do you, how do you wrap your mind around that? Um, it's like... After 2004, and we had done all the training, and we had gone there, it was honestly built a lot of confidence in me that I can do this. I had played the previous few years for um, great club teams in Europe. I played for Juve Dubrovnik, had great seasons, um, you know, lost only a, a, a few games. And I came back from that Olympics with a ton of confidence that I was ready to, like, that our team was ready to do something. Um, and then with U.S. water polo, Guy Baker became the coach, and he just kind of wanted to change everything. I think Ratko had a really nice – we had a really nice thing going, and if a coach wanted to come in and, and do what we were doing, we would have really, really done well. And Guy came in and kind of wanted to change everything, didn't really respect the work that we had put in, and uh, it was really unsuccessful in Montreal. I think we ended up 13th place. And then shortly thereafter is when uh, the U.S. Olympic Committee dropped our funding completely. So we went from, you know, small money to no money. And uh, that was, you know, it, it's, it's a long, it's a, it's a whole, whole story. Um, that's when there was a changeover in U.S. Water Polo. Chris Ramsey came in, um, went from kind of a mom and pop organization to more of a professional organization. Um, but yeah, that was probably, I mean, even considering what I had done in the past and all the hard work, that was the low point is 2005 and six. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you're, you know, at least I think probably for you personally, right. You feel like the work you're putting in is going towards something. And now yep. you, being you very successful else. overseas in professional leagues, like being very successful. And then, you, and then we, you know, for whatever reason was going sideways at home. Yeah. Yeah. And it's hard, you know, you talk about results where you feel like, well, maybe, maybe we're fourth at the 2004 Olympics, right? It's hard to kind of spin, spin 13th, right? At a world championships right. there. Exactly. Move forward. You had talked about, and, and, and you've kind of, you know, described yourself as a grinder, right? You and some of the UC Irvine guys, you know how to work hard. At what point, and you talked about feeling, feeling good physically after 04, maybe it's leading into 08. When, when do you start to feel less, and maybe you always view yourself as a grinder, but when do you start to really feel like, I, I understand how this works, and I know how to impose my will on this game? Yeah. Uh, some of my best times as a player were, was probably 2003. Uh, they used to have the Premier League. I don't know what it was called then. Oh, no, it was the Premier League. It, it was, was the WPL yeah. later. Uh, the Premier League. And – so we would be training these two weeks in a row, no breaks. Then we would have games with Premier League on, on weekends. And that was really high-level water polo. Um, that's the closest we've ever come in the United States to have a professional-level team. And uh, those were great tournaments. But I used to destroy people and score just ridiculous amount, amounts of goals. And at that time, it was, it was probably the peak of my career in, in the United States. And it was, you know, unstoppable. And that's real. I mean, I felt pretty unstoppable in college. I mean, I scored a ton. I scored a ton. But in 2003 and four, it was insane. Um, 
the only one who could stop me was, you know, not in the U.S. <laughs> to put it to put it mildly, you were you were feeling pretty pretty good during that year. Yep. It's interesting, and maybe it's recency bias, and, and not to get off topic, but I think a lot of people, or maybe it's because a medal was combined with it, but feel like you you played some of your best stuff later in your career, 08, like 12, and maybe that's yep. the combination of like physically being there and also mentally being there. Totally. Um, you know, hey, it, it might take me longer than some people, but I'll get there because I'll never stop and I'll always work. And you know, it's, it's the same New Orleans story that we were talking about earlier. It's like, hey, if you, you know, keep working out hard every day, you can start passing people. And, you know, I, I believe, I, I mean, I'm a talented guy, but I'm not the most talented guy. And um, I think in my career, it was just hard work over long periods of time and, and never giving up and never giving in. And, and you just keep grinding away. And eventually, you know, it, all, it can all come together for you. And it did for us in 2008. And that, that 08 group, and we, we talked about it with, with your teammates, really personified what you had talked about earlier, that us against them mentality. It was a team that outside of the team was not picked. I can remember looking at publications and things going into those Olympics. The sure. men were not anywhere towards the podium. And you look at results previously, and we touched on in that last conversation, you were slowly chipping away against the Serbias of the world and getting the score closer and closer how did that team from someone on the inside, how did they galvanize so well to go into that Beijing tournament? You come off super final silver as well. How did that come together so, so well in a way? Well, in 2005, 13th at the world championships, we didn't qualify for, you know, the Fina cup the following year or whatever it was. Then, then uh, we had a new coach. We finished ninth maybe in, in uh, Melbourne. Mm. And then, so everyone thought that ninth place was about where we should be. Uh, not us, but, you know, we had, um, we always had belief in ourselves. I don't know, irrationally, maybe. Um, and, you know, then it was Terry came in and said, you know, just said, hey, guys, you know, water polo, I'm going to come here, we're going to be a team, we're going to work together. And uh, we're going to do what you know how to do. And so we kind of took a step into some other tactics that we had done previously and and you know we all knew it very well and we were all willing to work and I, I you know I I've always thrived on the us against them kind of thing and uh, absolutely zero no one believed in us and it came down to uh, once we got to the Olympics I mean I, I think it might have been we played the Chinese first we always seem to play the, the host country so we win that game we're expected to win and and then it was Croatia, and Croatia had a great team, and we beat them. So that kind of put us in a position where, you know, we could potentially get into that medal round. Um, winning the group was still, like, not really a um, thought in our mind. But I think next it was uh, the Serbians, 4-2, tough game, played close. Um, and, and like I mentioned, I think last time we were on this call, is the Serbians had our number for a long time. Uh, pr the previous 50 times I had played them, no joke, they had beaten us. And so, we, you know, we had better luck against the Hungarians. We had gotten a couple victories um, over the years against them. But the Serbians were the ones who got us. And the German game uh, it was a very close game. There was a very good team. Uh, we pulled that one out in the last second on a, I know, a, call, a call finally bounced our direction. And uh, we ended up winning the group. So it's uh, – it was a, uh, it was huge for us, and the Serbians go on to you know play whoever they're going to play, and we meet with them in the cross in, in the uh, semifinal. So we went straight to the final four. We won our group, um, which we had been trying to do for years, and it finally happened. And uh, that game, like we talked about before, was a culmination of a lot of things. Best game that we ever played together, and we crushed them. So it was really pretty amazing. Yeah, that was just a, a, a tremendous, tremendous run through there. And I have to imagine the confidence is building as you, as you work through that tournament so that by the time you get, you know, you, you have that pivotal win over Germany to secure the group and then, uh, and then, and then to get in the semifinal and beat Serbia. This is, this, and this, and this is no knock on you, right? This has to be confidence that maybe you've never felt before as part of this team. I mean, 
you, you're feeling better than you've ever felt before, for sure. Um, confidence, maybe. Um, I feel like it was, it was growing throughout, throughout the Olympics, just like you said. We expected to be Germany. So at that point, we expected to win the group. Um, the Serbs, I mean, we can only reflect on the game that was less than a week ago. And we felt good following that. So, I mean, we definitely believed that we could win. And then once we beat them, it, you know, once you get to the gold medal game, it's kind of all bets are off. Weird things are going to happen. People can get lucky. You know, things could go sideways. So we're like, forget it. Let's just go for it. And, you know, we'll see what happens. Um, you know, the Hungarians were a great team. Uh, they had won the previous two Olympics. And, you know, super talented guys. Um, but at, at that point, things have been going our way. So it's, hey, let's just go for it and we'll see what we can do. And, and we touched on it a bit last time too, but, you know, you're in that game, right? It's, you know, it's going well for a half and then they, they end up pulling away in the second half and winning. And so you have this, from the outside, this unexpected result of a medal, which is, you know, the podium was the mantra, right? I, I remember Terry talking repeatedly about getting back to the podium because that's what hadn't happened for so long. So in a way you accomplished that goal, you know, kind of like we mentioned, you, you achieved your lifelong goal at 23, you were an Olympian, right? And so it's like, yeah. now again, you've achieved the goal, but as you get in these things, you realize that your goal was actually one more win. Right. I mean, and definitely, um, there's a lot of photos after the games where everyone's, you know, really bummed out and, and, uh, and following the Olympics even, there's a hangover. It's like, well, you know, a gold medal could have been life changing. Um, and it wouldn't have been, but that's what you're thinking at the time. Um, and you know, losing your last game of the Olympics is always disappointing, but you know, five years down the line or four years later, you kind of realize, Hey, this is something pretty cool. I mean, I could show my kids go share it at, you know, water polo clinics or things like that. But, um, you know, it's, it's to me, more than anything else, the silver medal is a kind of a symbol of all the, per all the work that went into it. Um, it's kind of like all wrapped up in that one thing. Um, to me, that's how I look at it. I mean, I, we did, I did a lot. I spent a lot of time at it. And so having the medal kind of makes the whole thing worth it. Yeah. Uh, yeah if, I, if that I, makes I, sense. No, totally. And you talked about uh, the other coaches you had that, you know, really like from a, from a physical grind, you know, ha having, having not played on any of these teams, I just saw from the outside, but I feel like Terry always had uh, great speeches, like great, great things to say, you know, and he had, he had played in, in the role you're in, right. He was a center way back when and had gone through coming up in a, you know, well, back in his day, right. It was goal differential. So there wasn't, there wasn't always a gold medal yeah. game, yeah. but having someone like him as, as the coach, even, even coming in late, um, what what did he bring to the mix, you know, as far as sharing his experience and just kind of saying saying maybe things that brought the group closer? You know, Terry did a great job bringing the group together. Um, we brought in some new players for that Olympics. Um, Peter Vralis was one. Um, some of the JW Krumpholtz. Um, and he did a good job making sure that we were all on the same page. We did a lot more team building things. I mean, it's stuff that I, you know, I would normally have snickered at in the past, like, oh, come on, what are we doing here? Let's, let's go do something, you know? And uh, Terry was a big believer in that stuff, and it worked. I mean, to my surprise, as like a salty older player on the team at this point, to my surprise, it was very effective, and Terry did, ended up doing a great job. Uh, Robert Lynn, who never gets mentioned, um, Robert Lynn um, ran a lot of our tactics, and Terry, his main responsibility was really bringing the group together, which and they, and they both did a, a fine job. And, and so that that whole group kind of stays together to 2012, and and that's another Olympics, right? Where it starts off really strong, and then yeah. and then doesn't go the way the group wants. And now you're at a part where you're towards the end of your career. And so sure. how do you how do you kind of handle this? Where now you know it's different when you're in Sydney and you think, well, I I can try and do this again, or maybe three yeah. more times. How do you handle it now where you know what it's like to be on the podium? Now you're not. You're also getting older. That has to be some tough things to process. Oh, for sure. It's, it's, a, it's a frightening thing. Um, so you know, too, too quickly, 2012 did not go as we planned. Um, you know, a lot of we, we all got, had gotten older. We had all gotten married. We had all had children. 
And so priorities change. Water polo is no longer the number one thing. It's not a great recipe for success at the Olympics. I, you know, I mean, we were still good players, but it just it was no longer life or death. And uh, so we move on from that. And truthfully, fin finishing your career after you've done it for so long, it's frightening um, because you don't know what your next thing is. <clears throat> Excuse me. And so I went to just, I decided that, okay, I'm going to be a fireman. And I went to a fire academy. Uh, that didn't end up happening, obviously. Um, I built a travel trailer in my backyard. I, you know, bought some 1950s thing and redid the whole thing just to keep myself busy to try and be doing something so that I could, you know, I did taught clinics. I coached water polo. I was just trying to stay busy and do all that I could to get out there. And eventually, um, it ended up being one of the kids I coached who his father said, hey, I have some friends I want you to meet. I think this would be a great career for you. And so water polo ended up lead, leading me to uh, my current career. And, uh, you know, I think, the, I think the important thing that I take from that experience, because it is scary and you're changing everything in your life and you're no longer as cool as you think you are because you're this, you know, water polo guy. Um, it's just important that you, to me, is you keep moving, keep trying things, um, move in a different direction if you have to, but you never give up and you always keep going. Um, we, we often talk about how water polo sets you up for things later in life. Uh, people sure. love to hire water polo players. They love, they love team, team athletes in general, right? Because you work well together in a business setting or wherever you might be, job site, whatever sure. it is. Now that you're out, I mean, you still, you still play here and there, but you're, you're more professional just in, in the career that you've taken on. How does what you learned in water polo help when you're when you're when you're dealing with things that don't go the way you want at work or you can't impose your will on sure. your kids going to bed at night when you want them to or whatever it might uh -huh. be well I, I just want to start with saying that i don't play water polo often but i still got it greg i could of still course. do it i could still do it if i have to um, <laughs> noted noted um so for a career it, you know it, it, like exactly what you said hey being a part of the team understanding that things aren't always going to go your way. Decisions don't have to always go your way. But if you're willing to, to put your head down, maybe not say a word and just keep on working, everything's going to work out okay. Um, water polo is a great uh, training for the real world and life and a job and a career. Because, um, you, know, you know, like, I, like me, I'm a part of a team at work. And it's my job to, you know, put my head down and go find more business. and I think it's great because I'm going to deal with losses in my career and I'm going to get some wins every now and then. And you just have to keep moving and not necessarily take to heart some of the bad losses that you've taken. And, you know, you can look at my career and, and uh, it's pretty clear I've had some, but I've also had some good wins and uh, it, it, it does kind of fit in with what I'm doing and sales is what I'm doing. So. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's, I, I think it's good for people to hear that you know, whenever water polo does end, what you learn will help, will help in other things you do. When you're part of a team and, and, and the teams you were on, you, you, you hit on it, you're so closely linked. You spend days and days, months with each other. You become like brothers. And so, you know, when, when someone else is going through something, it kind of becomes your problem too and vice sure. versa. And, you know, you had your own things during your career. I know, I know you lost your dad. He was very close to you throughout your career. How did being a part of that group help you get through some of those things? And how did you help others get through things that they were struggling with? Um, you know, we were a really, really tight group. Um, my dad passed away around Thanksgiving. I was living in Serbia at the time playing for a, a partisan Belgrade. And, uh, you know, we flew home and then uh, did, did a funeral very quickly. And then I flew back and actually played in a game that weekend. Um, it was brutal. Um, it was really tough. Uh, the guys in the team all knew my dad cause he had traveled with us a little bit cause he was the athletic trainer. Um, and you know, they're a good support system. It's a great group, really good families. I mean, we spent so much time together that I know all of their kids and, you know, wives and, and parents. And, uh, we had a, we had a great team. Um, and w even to this day, we still, we have a reunion coming up, even during COVID. I, 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 maybe it's not great, but we're doing it. And uh, they'll, they'll be my brothers forever. I mean, they're just, it's a great group of guys and, and they'll always be in my life. And I don't, re I don't talk to them enough anymore, but 
I mean, it'll be great when we all get together again. Yeah, and, and for anyone that missed uh, our talk a couple of weeks back, or maybe it was two months ago, I don't know what day it is anymore, when, when we had the 2008 conversation with Ryan and his teammates, you could tell it was guys that, you know, the minute they get back together, even in a virtual setting, you know, I eventually had to just kick them all off the Zoom because they'll just keep talking for, you know, for hours and hours about things. And so that bond is always there. I'm sure many of you that play on teams have something similar. Uh, really good stuff here, Ryan. Just kind of as we as we wrap up, everyone's dealing with a different kind of adversity now, whether uh, they're not with their team, they don't know when their next game will be. There are sure. bigger ticket items, right? Like uh, people losing jobs and health issues, and it runs the gamut, right? Yep. What what can people glean from from sports or from being on a team? What what do you learn that helps you kind of just get up the next day and keep going? Yeah, I wish I had something really inspirational to say. Um, but the the only thing, and I still take it to this, use it today. It's from Newland, and it's, hey, there's no secrets in life. It's about working hard every day and grinding it out. So. You know, at times everyone wants to feel, feel sorry for themselves or feel like things aren't going their way or things are really tough and it, it's, it's just awful. And it is in a lot of ways for a, a lot of people, including my family. Uh, but there's, there's two ways you can approach it. This is, uh, this is an opportunity for growth and to find something new or to make something good out of this situation. Or this is an opportunity where we can sit down and feel sorry for ourselves. So I'm choosing to, it's an opportunity for growth. I'm going to um, continue to work hard, continue to do what I'm supposed to be doing. And when we come out of this, and we will come out of this, when we do, um, my career and my family is going to be that much stronger because, you know, I, I kept on working and grinding it out. Sounds like a guy that had to swim 8,000 yards once upon a time for a practice. So, Hey, uh, 14,000, Greg, 14,000. 14, <laughs> we started at eight and worked our way up. Started at eight. <laughs> Ryan Bailey, uh, I, you know, this is, uh, you know, I think at, you talked about it. As you get older, you're able to reflect on things more. So I appreciate you kind of taking the time to go back through some things that I know when you went through them, they were not that fun. But I think your perspective now is helpful for those that are going through something as simple as a water polo loss or something else. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks, Greg. I appreciate it. Appreciate it. Thanks, everyone. Thanks to Ryan, and we'll be talking to you soon. Everyone take care.